Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to our live stream. My name is Ken Quartz, and I'm the Vice Dean of Faculty and Research at the Rotman School. I'd like to welcome you all to the second of our live author talks hosted by Rotman Events. Although we're gathered virtually today, we are nonetheless brought together by the Rotman School and the University of Toronto, uh, and as such, it's appropriate to begin with the land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I have the great pleasure today of introducing my colleague and our speaker today, Joshua Gans. Joshua is a professor of strategic management and holder of the Jeffrey Skoll Chair of Technical Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Rotman School. He teaches MBA students entrepreneurial strategy and is also the chief economist at the Creative Destruction Lab. Joshua's research is primarily focused on understanding the economic drivers of innovation and scientific progress, the nature of technological competition, economic growth, digital publishing economics, industrial organization, and regulatory economics. His work has been published in many prestigious economics journals, including the American Economic Review, the Journal of Political Economy, the Rand Journal of Economics, and so on. Joshua is also the author of The Disruption Dilemma and co-author of several books, including most recently, Innovation Plus Equality and Prediction Machines, The Simple Economics of Artificial Intelligence. His latest title, Economics in the Age of COVID-19, was released as an ebook on April 21 by MIT Press First Reads. Many of you purchased a copy of the ebook before today's talk, a paperback edition with updated material will be released later this year in November. We'll hold another event then so that Joshua can discuss the new content. Details of that talk can be found on the Rotman Events website. With that introduction, it's my pleasure to hand things over to Joshua. Hi Ken, thanks very much. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm, I can't see anyone out there, but I am told uh, there are a number of uh, people out listening to this. Uh, which I am thrilled about. So let me um, uh, first uh, share my screen with you so that you can see uh, my presentation today. So as Ken already mentioned, I have written a book, Economics in the Age of COVID-19. Uh, how did that happen? Well, like many people in the middle of March, I was suddenly at home and while, you know, that shouldn't actually mean any disruption at all to my work life, uh, there's not a lot I do that depends on anything other than sitting in front of a computer. Uh, and of course, uh, I have online classes, so I didn't have to worry about uh, changing the way I dealt with students. I found myself very unproductive, spending all my time uh, obsessing over data for uh, pandemics and infections and deaths. Uh, that I didn't know very much about beforehand. Uh, and it reminded me of this uh, cartoon from The Onion back in uh, September 2001. Not knowing what else to do, woman bakes American flag cake. And I wondered, you know, what is it that I have some sort of advantage in doing and maybe I should just do that. And as it turns out, I seem to be able to write a lot of books. Uh, people seem to like them. They are, for the most part, trying to explain academic things in a more uh, accessible manner. And so I really felt that on March 19th, this was me, and what I should do is write a book, and I did. It's this. And that book was published uh, just over a month later on the 22nd of April as an ebook, and there's a new version being developed. So, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through uh, some of the themes from that book, um, not all of them. It's, it's, it's a full book. There's only so much I can do, but I'm also going to stress things that actually aren't in the book in terms of the way that I now put the whole saga together. Uh, so I've, I've accumulated now a whole month of extra wisdom, double the amount before, uh, and I'm going to try and share some of that with you here today. So I was aided 
when I set out on nine, March 19th to write this book by a wealth of economic research. My economist colleagues around the world had similarly realized that they didn't know what to do with themselves. And what they're good at, uh, what their uh, comparative advantage is, is in writing papers tailored to their disciplines uh, and the particular subfields. And so there was a massive pivoting. And so from my perspective, as I was writing this, there was a deluge of high level economic thinking about how to frame the myriad of economic issues that were being thrown at us on a daily basis. And so part of my role was to set out to absorb that research as well and include it in the book. And some of it will be in the next edition as well because it's just kept coming. Here's the big takeaway that I want you to get from this talk today. And the takeaway is this, pandemics are manageable. Now I say this very strongly because back in March and for most of the time I was writing the book, I was under the strong impression that this had been a calamity, it had happened on us, you know, we're going to have to deal with it. We will have to think in the future of how to make ourselves more resilient. You know, it's a big wake up call, etc. But as I've explored it in more detail, it seems to me, and there's now evidence to support this as well, that pandemics need not be the calamity that we have had thrust on us. And so let me try and explain that to you throughout this talk. So where do we start? We've got a whole population of people like those just shown here. And that population of people uh, eventually has someone who is infected. Now what you want to do with someone who happens to have the novel coronavirus that is the thing that gives rise to the disease that is COVID, is you want to take that person and you want to isolate them from everyone else. If you can do that to every single infected person, this will not spread, people will be safe, you don't have to shut down the economy, and more importantly, the virus will have nowhere to go and will die out. So that's what we want to achieve. Now, as we are all trying to think about this, we have to ask ourselves, well, what's stopping us? You know, what, it's easier said than done, I guess, is the, is, the, is, is the quick message here. So pandemics are manageable in the sense you isolate someone, they recover, and then you can return them to the population and you're done. If you don't manage them in this way, if you do not remove them or isolate them, then what happens is of course, the virus starts spreading to nearby individuals who then spread it to others, who then spread it to others and so on and so forth until everybody's got it. Now it's not quite like that. There's a whole, uh, a few intermediate steps, but this is the broad concern we're worried about. What you're forced to do, if you cannot identify that person who's clearly uh, fevered in the middle and separate them from everyone else, is you sort of recognize this coming and say, before everybody gets sick, here's what we should do. You can't get sick if you're not near anyone. And so everybody's got their own places to go. And so what do we do? We move them. We move them into all these different places here. In other words, we're doing to everybody, we're doing to everybody what we just wanted to do to the person who was infected. And in the process, we take the person who's infected out as well. The problem is, of course, you're doing a bit of this, where you're putting the person who's infected with some buddy who isn't, and so they will eventually become infected. And 
Also, you have to have some people out and about doing things like giving you electricity, uh, getting you food, the healthcare workers, etc. And you're going to miss some people. And so this process is a very costly one, as you can see, but it is also a very um, uh, imperfect one. It is not perfect. It takes a while for stuff to, to work its way out this way. So what you want to do, of course, is have some method by which you can identify the infected person. Now, with COVID-19, here's the problem. The problem is, it's not like the movies. When you, here's how a pandemic was supposed to go in the movies. You were supposed to, somebody gets infected, all of a sudden they're sort of like convulsing, da, 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 dying, get away from that person, we're all, so, we're fine. That's not what happens here. The COVID-19 is like a real problem for us being able to do what we want to do because for four or five days, or maybe throughout the entire length, of someone's infection, they are not symptomatic at all. They don't get sick. They don't present things like fever, difficulty in breathing, loss of smell and other things. So you don't have any means of distinguishing that person who's actually infected from everybody else. What you wanna do is you wanna gather information. What you'd like to have happen is you'd like for something to happen to them, such as you'd like their nose to be a big right red Rudolph the red nose reindeer type color and then you can say hey that person's infected and and you can isolate them uh, quite readily that's what you'd like to do but in the absence of that what do we have to do we have to ourselves go in and work out who is infected and who isn't delving you know beneath the skin literally to be able to do that and that's where testing comes in so pandemics are manageable if you can solve the pandemic information problem. And the pandemic information problem is very clear. You need to identify people as soon as they become infected so that you can take an action and remove them from everyone else and isolate them from everyone else. The first step in that is being able to recognize someone who is infectious and distinguish between them and someone who is not infectious. In the absence of that, what you're doing is you're going to presume everybody is dangerous and treat everybody the right way that way and isolate the whole lot of them. That's clearly costly from both, uh, in particular, from an economic perspective. But if you can solve the pandemic information problem, the pandemic is manageable. That is the takeaway I want you to get here. The pandemic is 100% an information problem. The problem we face, of course, is it's a big information problem. There are a lot of things that we would like to know that we do not know and still do not know about COVID-19 that could help us manage that information problem and start to do the things we have to do. What are the things we don't know? Well, individually, and this is the big one, we don't know who is infectious and who is not. We sometimes know later on when they're really, really ill and go to a hospital, et cetera, uh, we know if they're infectious. We can also find out if they're infectious if we conduct a test. The tests aren't 100% perfect, they're costly, and that's an issue. We haven't con conducted anywhere near the number of tests to be able to solve that problem using testing alone. But there's a whole lot of things we also don't know generally which could assist us in managing the pandemic. We don't know how many people actually have COVID-19. Why don't we know that? Because we don't know if someone's infectious or not. We don't know how many people who have had COVID-19. In other words, if you had it in the past and you are immune, we don't know that. We know it if you've passed through the hospital system. But as I've already said, part of the problem is a large fraction of the people with COVID-19 are not getting anywhere near the hospital system. We may be missing half or more. 
we don't know how serious this is still. <laughs> it looks pretty serious. It looks like uh, a lot of people become sick when they get COVID-19. We don't know how many become sick and what sort of sicknesses they have. We have ideas, but there's a big room for margin for error. We don't know how many people will be permanently harmed or die from COVID-19 if they get it. So we look a lot at case fatality rates, that is the number of people coming into the hospitals, how many people end up being able to leave. And depending on the age group and looking on the average of the population, and it's currently coming in about 1% who survive COVID-19 of the people who get it. But we don't know how many people who are recovering from it are gonna have permanent issues. Of course, we're not gonna know that. One of the reasons is this has not been with us that long yet. We don't know what makes the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, spread. We don't know a huge amount about that. Previously, it could have been every, everything. We are starting to narrow the funnel of uncertainty on that. We're starting to suspect it's more transmissions uh, from people to people when they're talking to each other and spending some time with each other than it is lasting a while on services. We are starting to suspect it's more of an indoor issue than an outdoor issue. And there is some evidence that different people uh, get it in different manners and are infectious in different manners. Some people are more infectious being able to spread it to others than, than other people. We don't know how long people are infectious for. You know, usually you think about these things as long as they are still carrying it. If they're not carrying it, they shouldn't be infectious. But of course, some of these tests are imperfect and some other issues occur. So we don't know how long people are infectious. All of these things are the fundamental things that have to go into the epidemiological models that would allow us to even just understand what's going on with this crisis from a public health perspective. And the final thing we do not know is whether people can be actually immune from the coronavirus. That is, they can develop antibodies and those antibodies keep it away and they do it for some significant period of time. That is an assumption. It's an assumption I base my entire book on because the thought of it not being the case is too hard, but that's not actually uh, a really good excuse. We still do not know if we're immune and that matters for the policy decisions we might make. So what are the possible end games from this whole thing? What are our ways, that, what's, what are the ways in which this thing ends? Well, the first end game is immunity. And there's two paths to immunity. The first path is that the coronavirus and COVID-19 runs its course, goes through the population until a sufficient number of people have had it, that it's not being spread around very much anymore and may eventually stop being spreading together. The time frame for that is about three years that it will take for that to happen based on, on current information. In other words, it has not spread very much thus far. Maybe 5% of the population in Canada, uh, it's unlikely more than that. The health harm from that is huge. Why? Because we're gonna run it through the population, some good fraction of the population are get it and 1% of them are gonna die. That's huge. The economic harm from this is also high. It's not a cheap option. Why? People don't want to die. They don't really want to get the coronavirus. In fact, if the coronavirus can die out and everybody else can become immune and you've never had to have it, that's great for you. Problem is everybody thinks that. So we're going to have social distancing occurring, whether we mandate it or not. The second path to immunity is we develop a vaccine. The time frame for that is very uncertain. I put it here a range of one to three years. Three years is faster than any vaccine in history. <laughs> so uh, take what you will about one. One is uh, uh, what the politicians are praying for every night. And it's just prayer. prayer. Maybe it happens, great if it did, don't know. 
The health harm, if we get a vaccine and get it quickly, is of course low or relatively low. The economic harm is potentially very high because if we knew for sure a vaccine was coming, you definitely didn't want to go out. You want to wait for that vaccine to come. So we're going to have a lot of social distancing and a lot of reduction in economic activity while we wait. There's a final end game that did not, in my opinion, get talked about nearly enough. And that is suppression. That is, we have the ability to take this virus, knock it out in as little as three to six months. And in many respects, we still do. But in order to do that, we have to solve the pandemic information problem, which means we have to test people, see if they're infected, isolate them. We have to then record who they came in contact with, possibly isolate them as well. But if we do that, very few people will get the coronavirus and COVID-19 and the economic harm, because this will be a short period, can be low. In fact, if we solve the information problem, we need not socially distance at all, apart from if you happen to be the small set of people who are infected, in which case you probably want to be isolated anyway. Why do we know that that final thing is a possibility? Because we did it before. It happened. In 2003, we had the first coronavirus, the SARS uh, crisis. It was a big crisis in some places, less so in others. But look at what happened. The SARS, uh, the, the coronavirus at the heart of SARS was more infectious than the coronavirus we've got now. In other words, it's much easier to pass between people and it was far more deadly. 10% of people who got, the, uh, SARS, got SARS died from it very deadly. So it's a, on paper, a much worse situation. In this, in this environment, what happened is it was crushed. People noticed, were able to isolate people, and it was crushed. Now, why was it crushed? Because with SARS, unlike COVID-19, SARS, you only become infectious when you develop symptoms. In other words, everybody, almost everybody had a bright red nose. Initially, it would look like the flu, but once people realized it was running about, anyone with the flu was isolated. Anyone with those symptoms was isolated. And within, uh, here you can see, within six months worldwide, SARS was gone, gone. We still do not have a vaccine for SARS. Well, we have a candidate, but we haven't got uh, an actual one. We still don't have it. We don't need it. It's gone. You think that was a fluke? This is MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Symptom, came only five years ago. Hit China, they suppressed it immediately. Hit South Korea, they let it get out, but they dealt with it. In just over a month, were able to crush the virus there. The, only a handful of people got that one, just as well, because it killed 50% of people who got it. So this is just an, something that we can do. Again, MERS was easier to tell than COVID-19, than the coronavirus this time, the novel coronavirus. But it gives us the indication of what we should do here. And we know that we can do it for this one as well. Let us take Australia and New Zealand. Australia and New Zealand, you're familiar with these graphs. This is the number of daily cases of COVID-19 that are confirmed the new cases in each uh, country from the time where it was considered already had arrived in that country. And you'll notice here, Australia and New Zealand, and this is a log scale, and it's really good news that everybody is now knows what a log scale is and can be uh, understand, but at the bottom, we have smaller increments at the top, much bigger increments. In other words, uh, it, it's, it's blowing up the, uh, the uh, uh, bottom parts uh, with more variation and makes it look worse than it is in comparison to the top. But in these cases, Australia and New Zealand, they have crushed the coronavirus. They have virtually now wiped them from their shores. They don't let anyone in. They can have normal economies, but without tourism, <laughs> basically, or without any of the things that come from that. 
but nonetheless, that's a good outcome. That is the difference between having a Great Depression and having a recession, being able to do that. They're not the only ones. South Korea and Taiwan did it as well. Taiwan acted earlier than everybody else in the world. South Korea had a little bit of trouble at the beginning. Uh, someone attended a large church service and it spread all through their like wildfire, but they had massive testing. And both of these countries did not have to shut their countries down. They were able to test, trace and isolate. And in each case, they are able to keep their economies running. The virus is gone from Taiwan. It's not gone from South Korea, but they keep on going. Okay, you can do this. It can be done. Italy and Spain did not do this. Italy and Spain, you can see there, right at the top there, large, huge outbreaks in each case, uh, large numbers of fatalities as a result of that, uh, because they did not believe uh, the virus was coming for them and did not notice until it was too late. And then they had to engage in massive lockdowns, highly enforced ones, to be able to push things down again which of course they are doing. They've both got very clear peaks and a very good trajectory going on there. Nowhere near eliminating the virus yet, but at least on a way whereby they can get to a position where they can start doing the things that they should have done in terms of testing and tracing and resolved issues. Germany and Austria, similar picture. Germany even more notable for having a lot of cases but very few deaths because they were able to manage that side of the equation better. Austria, a, a decline curve, now it's hovering around of, uh, uh, um, 40, 50 cases per day. So it's still got some work to do, but nonetheless, you can see um, some progress being made. And here is Canada. Canada is more comparable to the United Kingdom. That it doesn't have the United Kingdom's trajectory was because there was a week of extra preparation, a week of getting to shutdowns and lockdowns and understanding that there was something on the horizon. And so Canada came out uh, slightly lower than the United Kingdom. However, notice here, it's, it's a persistent bugger. It's keeping on going. In other words, we are creating as many new cases today as are people being uh, recovered. And so, what this means is it's endemic, it's going on. So the concern we have here is like, you can't very easily have more opening up of the economy without that popping back to another part. We, we have flattened this thing, but not much more. But then again, it could be worse. You could be the United States or Sweden. In both of those cases, at least on a per capita basis, many more infections going on on a daily basis, very little evidence that it is coming down. That United States curve looks like it's got a negative slope, but that's one city, New York, that was able to do what Italy and Spain were doing. One city, take that out, the United States is still flying upwards. That's a problem, they're our nearest neighbor. So, what are we currently doing? What is the plan for the Canadian government? The plan for the Canadian government does not look like very much. There's a lot of hope in this, a vaccine coming, but there's big doubts about this amount of uh, 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 figure here of when it will actually arrive. That's a problem because we're getting paying this while we wait. For running its course, well, we're not doing that either. We're, we're, we're sort of running its course, but we're trying to slow it down a bit. So we're more in, we're, we're not in this uh, band, and we're a bit more in that uh, way of getting the immunity, but it's a bet, it's a bet. What we are not doing is this one here, or what we're not doing is doing uh, a, a, a push to flatten the curve to suppress the virus so we can get in a situation where we can start taking this part seriously. That we're not doing. And it's a bit of a mystery why, because once we get our numbers down enough, we're going to get into that SARS territory. 
and we can start pushing it, pushing it down further, and we can do better here. Why aren't we doing that? I don't have a good answer for that. One of the reasons why this is all happening differently than expecting, and this is the economist's contribution to this. So if you ran an epidemiological model uh, on this uh, coronavirus, unchecked, without any uh, interventions at all, it was gonna rise up like this and then fall and then in about uh, a year or so sort of disappear. That's what was expected. But what actually happened is we have we don't have a model uh, of a virus where people do not understand that there's a virus around. We are, have a model where after a period of time, people realize, oh my goodness, I could go out and then there's a, uh, you know, there's a chance that I could get this thing, actually a pretty high chance, and I could be in the hospital on a ventilator or some other, uh, or something similar. And so what people do is originally they start going and, and, and practicing this and they sort of track where your epidemiologic uh, models would have, but then they start to realize, oh crap, this is not good. And they socially distance. And it's quite extraordinary. In all of the data, you see this happening. In other words, these models have not proven right on how quickly the infection spread because people were changed from this phase to this phase. And the issue associated with that is, of course, we get this flattening the curve, which pushes out the time. And during that entire time, we've got economic cost. And that's, of course, what we're worried about here. And you can see this. This is Canada's uh, reproduction number. That is the number at any given time uh, of this uh, virus of the number of people a single infected person was uh, likely to infect. And you can see it started up high here at about two and then dropped down at that point where I said, this was when we started to have the lockdowns and the seriousness and everything like that. And it hovers now just below one. Now that turns out to be a fairly stable relationship that we see everywhere. We see everywhere on a locality by locality basis that people start to socially distance enough that you start to hug this R equals one line. And I think there's something deep there, but I'm not gonna talk about it today. The other thing we have to worry about in managing all this is what happens with regard to our um, healthcare. The original reason we had lockdowns was not because we were uh, caring about people per se, um, trying to slow the rate of the virus. So we did this, the hope was to do something like that to the virus um, in terms of an infection rate by having lockdowns. And the reason for that was we had this capacity line for healthcare, which if we'd done nothing, would have left all these people without any medical treatment. So what we did rather than do that is we took this line and we surged it. We built extra bed capacity, extra hospitals, got the military involved and uh, much to my, uh, I must admit, surprise, that actually worked. Um, in countries which were slow to this, like Italy, they ended up missing that uh, opportunity. But in countries like Canada, in the United States, were able to do that. So during this period of time, if you're going to be running the virus, you've got to actually expand healthcare capacity for that whole period of time. Um, the irony of it there is that people feel more confident to go out as well because they don't feel as risky. So it's, a, it's an issue. Where we look like now is, as you can see in Canada and the United States, there's been some pushing down in the United States, mainly because of the dealing with New York of the um, uh, virus and now a hugging of R equal to one, which has sort of flattened it out. The problem is, of course, this was under actual government lockdowns. And once we start to get removed those lockdowns here and here, well, anything could happen and we could have a second surge. Now, again, this will be mitigated by social distancing, 
but you can see here that we're far from being done yet. Wouldn't it have been better if we just kept on tracking this until we got to zero in each of these cases? One of the real ways we can do that once we get the case numbers low enough for new uh, cases, the information problem becomes easier when you, when you do that. One way you could do that is we can, of course, test people, which can I identify that person in the middle there. And we can take them and we can isolate them. The other uh, problem with that is our testing, it's very hard to get someone tested and isolated as soon as they've got the coronavirus. Uh, partly, of course, we're only testing, mostly testing people with symptoms. So we already know that's a bit too late. Uh, but also just even if we we're just guessing at it, we would miss people. And in particular, we miss the people this person while infected has had contact with. But the good news is we know they were infected. And once we know they're infected, we can find out who they've had contact with. And what we can do, rather than being one step behind, is we can get one step ahead and isolate those people as well. In other words, we don't have to wait for a test. We can presume a certain number of people have been in contact with an infected person, may they themselves be infected as well, and we can get uh, that checked out. And in the meantime, we can isolate, quarantine them, or what have you. So testing in conjunction with tracing can do a lot of good. It is, tracing is a complement to testing in solving the pandemic information problem. Now, when you can do this, if we get ourselves back to where we've got a low enough number of cases, then what we can do is we'll end up being on this situation and then we can start testing people and we can do this, bring it straight down. This is the path we want to have happen. And the interesting thing about this path is this could be June. If we get to a position where we've got a low number of infections in June, we can then put in the place to manage this the way that South Korea and Taiwan have managed it and Australia and New Zealand. That's what we wanna be and we still can do that. And then we're over this by the end of the year. Vaccine be damned. Now a constraint on this is privacy. An economist Paul Romer suggested that what we should do is test everybody weekly or twice weekly, everybody, all 37, 36 and a half million of the Cana of Canadians, all 300 and whatever million US people, etc., and test them at a huge rate. And the reason he did that, rather than say, well, we should test and also use contact tracing, is because he was worried, because people were worried about privacy. Because every time people talked about tracing, uh, there were people who got nervous about privacy and he thought, well, maybe we shouldn't have that argument and we'll just rely on testing. I think that's not going to ha happen. Theoretically, it works, but it's not going to happen. And the price of the issues are sort of of varying degrees. One way in which you do contact tracing is you have people who go out, interview infected people, find out who they've had contact with, and then chase everybody down and tell them to go and isolate themselves. Well, it's called dirty boots epidemiology because people have to run around doing the hard task. We can also have apps. We can have location notification. If everybody was tracking where they were being located, and then if somebody became uh, infected, what you'd do is you'd look back over uh, everybody whose location path crossed theirs, and you'd notify them and you'd isolate them that way. Uh, the problem with that is people have to start doing something they don't like doing, which is having their location tracked. And also at some point they have to share it somewhere off of themselves uh, to be able to have this identification occur. You could have proximity detections where you uh, uh, have registered, you're walking around with your mobile phone. Uh, if you come in close contact with somebody, you end up, uh, 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 it gets recorded. And if some one of those people ends up being infectious, you get a thing saying you had a, uh, you, you uh, were in a place with an infected person and you get told you should isolate. The big issue is you can have that data and you can give it to individuals. 
The problem with that is it's not necessarily enough. What you want to do to really manage this and manage contact tracing and that perfectly is you want to have it disclosed to public health officials. So the takeaway is the more data disclosed to public health officials, the more effective is contact tracing. Obviously, the more data exposed to public health officials, uh, the more the privacy concerns. But we're really in a realm where these privacy concerns have a relationship between the economic and health costs of this pandemic. And so we need the way to alleviate those privacy concerns. And at some level, we need a trusted person in that role. And if we don't have it now, that's not good. It would be nice to have had that. When you have that, you can do things like they do in South Korea, where people's locations and locations of affected are automatically uploaded to a public database and then put in an app and you can literally check if you've got anywhere near anyone who's infected or not. I mean, they literally put it all up there and you can see that. And in some areas, you might be able to identify that person, but most cases you would not be able to. And you can see the effects of that. South Korea, where they did that on a very high level, testing and tracing, people's reduction in economic activity was not that large, say, compared to Spain that had a massive outbreak. Those negative figures there, that's the depth of the recession you are getting. That's the depth of your economic hit. So there are phases to all of this. There's containment that I've talked about, I, social distancing, bringing this under control. That gives you an opportunity to reset. And when you reset, what you can do is you can do the things you should have done here. Then we, the book actually goes on to talk about recovery and how to prepare for the future. And let me make a couple more remarks there before we get to some of the questions that were submitted earlier. How do we reopen? Well, there's two issues in reopening. The first issue is how dangerous is this business for coronavirus infections? You like going to the gym? That's a problem. The other uh, issue is how important is the business for the community? Okay, we've already made some decisions on what is important for the community. Okay, we've already decided that we, it's important to have supermarkets, important to have healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. They're right on the, uh, the high end of both, but we've gone over that line. But in reality, what we're going to do is we're going to trade off. We don't want to have infection stuff out. We want to have important stuff out. And so we're going to trade those things off. Somewhat surprisingly, Movie theaters aren't that dangerous because you can potentially manage these viruses, okay? Also, universities and colleges are things we could uh, potentially manage as well and already are uh, to some degree. The things we're gonna have problems are sit down restaurants, places of worship, cafes, juice bars, pubs, etc. This little part here, actually all of this little part here is a bit of a problem. So we have to make that ranking. And, you know, we are slowly doing that as we understand more about how dangerous particular businesses are. Um, let me just uh, skip this slide here. Just because, I, oops, excuse me. It's great, I've got it on YouTube and I can't do a, a thing. All right, so uh, this was just to point out that what we're trying to do is to take the bucket of things that we've got in the restricted uh, bu bucket of stuff thus far and try to make them more livable. And also what we're trying to do is to move people from the restricted to the unrestricted element, which means making it safe. Another thing we might want to start to think about and people have talked about is immunity passports. As people get the coronavirus, some people have had it, well, they should be able to freely walk around if in fact we're immune. The problem we have thus far is that the tests that evolve for immunity have a 5% error rate. This is significant because if we run this through the Canadian population and we assume that currently, which is not true, 10% were infected and 90% are still susceptible to the coronavirus, this error rate really bites. You can see here, if we ran that, most of the people who were previously infected would test positive for the antibodies, but a good share of those who are not infected would. And so the probability that you're actually immune is only 
In other words, it's not even 50-50 <laughs> if you got a positive test for this uh, uh, antibodies. So the idea of having confidence that someone is immune based on a, uh, a test for, for, for these uh, antibodies based at that error, error rate is not good enough. Now, once, if these numbers swapped, then it'd be fine. But right now, that's a problem or, and into the future. We also want to think about the vaccines we're developing. Uh, we have a lot of uncertainty here. How long is it before a candidate's going to be a prospect? How long before a candidate is declared safe for you? For use, and we can speed that up by having clinical trials, of course, but they're a little slow. And also this thing called challenge trials where people volunteer to have the vaccine and be exposed to the virus so that we at least get a hint whether the damn thing's working. And then finally, once we've got all through that, we have to make hundreds of millions of doses of the thing. And that requires manufacturing. You can't just sort of say, ah, you know, throw it into an existing pharmaceutical plan or whatever, or existing vaccine thing. It's all specialized. It all has to be built out and built out a huge capacity. And each month of delay in getting these uh, vaccines out is going to cost the global economy $345 billion. Now, that's a big enough cost for you to build a lot of capacity quickly. But what? What do you do? Bill Gates has actually decided to build uh, plans for, for seven of the leading candidates to at least accelerate this forward by a few months. But where's Canada going to be in that list? When will each country get the deliveries from that? When will that occur? Canada may develop the vaccine. We have some can, uh, places researching here, but it doesn't have the uh, manufacturing capability for it. So what's going to happen? We're going to have to ration. And when we ration, we're going to have to work out who gets it first and who gets it later. This is a big issue that's coming, and I'm just going to highlight that it's coming, and I, I spend a bit of time talking about it in the book. Finally, we get down to brass tacks. What should managers do? Here's a chart that shows the current strategy for US colleges and universities for the fall. Most are planning for in-person classes. A few are waiting to still decide, although when you think about it, time is running out. 2% are planning for online. By the way, one of those is McGill University now, a lot of universities in Quebec have already decided to do so. And others are proposing a hybrid model where some will be online and some is in class. And as I understand it currently, that is the uh, University of Toronto's likely uh, outcome, at least it's been communicated to us recently. Manageable crisis. It shouldn't have happened. There are ways of managing it. There are ways of managing it at the source, and there are other ways of managing it as well. Lesson number two. In forecasting the future, any trend that has accelerated, online education, work from home, Zoom meetings, etc., are likely to be part of a permanent change. And that's going to impact on your prospects for different sorts of businesses. And with that, I've completed the formal part of my presentation. And so, uh, Ken, if you'd like to come back with the questions, that'd be great. I'm back. Thanks, Joshua. That was uh, fantastic. Really interesting. Uh, we do have some time, about a little over 10 minutes, to address some questions from the audience. We had a handful of questions submitted in advance of today's event. We'll see how many of those we can get through. Um, let me start with a question from Jim Fisher, who's a professor emeritus at Rotman. Uh, he asks, if the reaction to the pandemic is a hard turn away from globalization, feeding strong support for trade interference of all kinds, uh, will we not see higher costs for pretty much everything non-digital? And does that mean that central banks will have to go back to their old role of inflation fighting? Well, back to, uh, oh, that's a, a couple of parts to that, but let's talk about the trade bit right now. There's the short run and there's the long run. In the short run, obviously, we have problems with trade. Uh, the safety of it, uh, to the extent that we need people moving and people who need to travel in order to establish trade relations, obviously, we're going to have a, a difficulty. And so we're going to see prices rise for those goods. Uh, that's just natural. It'd be nice if uh, 
some countries didn't also add taxes that we call tariffs on that to make that even worse. But you know, whatever. It's going to be kind of interesting to see what that occurs. I think the bigger issue there is going to come with our little vaccine and, uh, issues or any treatments that come up and how we're going to have international trade in that. That is going to be, I don't think uh, anyone's fully grasped the problems associated with that right now. Um, and then there's the long run. If I am right and this uh, pandemic and other pandemics are manageable. There is no reason why we can't go back to the global economy we did before, at least not for reasons of this. I don't underestimate anybody's ability for their own agenda of trying to reduce uh, the amount of uh, global integration of using this as an excuse for that. That's a whole other matter. That's a political science question, not an economics question. But in terms of being able to manage pandemics, if we choose to do so, we can do so, and we can go back to doing all of the activities we did before, uh, should we want to, and trade would be one of them. Um, does this mean that the central banks have to get back on inflation? No, no, that's all demand side issues, as I understand it, we can ask a macroeconomist, but I, I don't think, uh, I don't think our former Dean Tiff Macklin is going to have a bigger inflation problem for the rest of his career than uh, was resolved in the past couple of decades. Great. Uh, uh, another question from Rob Dowler, who's uh, an adjunct professor at, at U of T in the graduate program in urban and regional planning. He asks, what are your thoughts on recent suggestions in a New York Times article that the 1995 to 2010 back to cities movement and the related explosion in housing prices in superstar cities, cities uh, might reverse as more dense places like New York and maybe even Toronto become less desirable in a post COVID world. Uh, will the significant advantages of urban agglomeration be tempered by a desire for greater social distancing in the future? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I think when it comes down to it, uh, I'm still, uh, on the optimistic side uh, of that equation. Um, I think in terms of people living in cities, I think the things that they like about cities can come back if we believe the pandemics are manageable. Um, and so, you know, uh, and even now during a pandemic, it's kind of good to be in a city as well. You've got much better access to healthcare and deliveries and all sorts of other things as well internet, etc. Um, so, so I don't think uh, these are going to be uh, permanent changes. I think, you know, obviously short run, there's going to be an impact on rents and things like that, uh, especially in places where people are sort of moving around and have gone home and what have you. But in the long run, uh, I'm optimistic that this is manageable and we can do things about it. That said, there's an interesting issue of commercial real estate. Guess what we've all seen? we can work at home. You know, that was a space that during the day was not occupied and is now can be occupied. And our offices are lying empty. And it's not like we went to zero productivity. So somewhere someone is going to say, do I need to be spending all of this money on this workplace? And do I need to have it in a very central downtown location? That question will be asked, and it's mainly because of our experience. We have a, a trend here. We've now forced ourselves to work out what it means to not work in an office and to work from home. And I think that is going to, it would be surprising to me that there weren't offices and businesses, et cetera, who decide that might be a good thing. And maybe there's another way to organize this at much cheaper cost. We had a number of other questions submitted. Uh, there was a, a strong theme on uh, inflation. Um, that first question that I read also touched on inflation. Um, maybe in lieu of reading those other questions, I'll just ask if you have anything else to say on the subject of inflation. I know you kind of suggested a minute ago you'd leave that to the macroeconomists. We had a, a, quite a lot of interest from others who submitted questions uh, in the question of what would happen to inflation with the um, all the stimulus being uh, provided to uh, sustain people through this lockdown period. Yes, yeah, so I do have a whole chapter in my book about that uh, and about the uh, re recession. This is a, uh, you know, it's a different recession than we've had previously because we know it caused it. 
It's not like some people having their financial casino that ends up spilling over to the real economy and we don't know who really deserves to be shut down and who doesn't. We don't know who deserves to be shut down at as a result of this. We all should be, uh, you know, business should be in, at least conceptually able to get started in all its uh, glory back again. And so all of the money that was being either printed, spent or whatever you want to call it, uh, was about keeping those businesses open, relationships between employers and employees uh, there. So the place you, you may go often uh, nominally be furloughed and go in and register for unemployment benefits, but as soon as this thing is over, you'll go straight back to the business that employed you and hopefully be able to do that. Now, things aren't as simple as that. In some countries, the effect, because this is short duration, you can bounce back. The United States has some 20 million, 30 million people out of work. It went, you know, literally like this. The chances of those, all those people going back to work like this uh, doesn't seem right, doesn't seem likely. Um, so that's going to be a problem there. And that's a problem for Canada as well. Some things are going to slow to reopen. Nobody's going to be rushing to travel. Nobody's going to be rushing to restaurants and all those sort of more optional activities that employed a lot of people. And so what to do about that is a real issue. But are we going to get inflation as a result of that? Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, the government can uh, take money out of the system just as easily as it threw money into the system. And so maybe there'll be some work managing that, but we're not like going to have hyperinflation or anything <laughs> like that. Let me ask you one last question. On one of your summary slides there, I, I may summarize this uh, slightly wrong, but it said something like, um, in predicting the future, every temporary change will become permanent, something like this. Um, do you think there are exceptions to that where there might be a kind of rebound effect where the experience of social distancing leads people to actually value certain things that they're now foregoing more uh, and, and, and actually bounce back rather than sustain these changes? So it's very interesting. I mean, obviously, uh, one thing to provoke that is the business we're in, which is education. Um, we were told for years, ah, it's impossible to get people to, how we get the faculty to use the technology, they'll never be able to do it, blah, blah, blah. And in two weeks, they, no problem, did it. They grumbled. <laughs> they grumble anyway. Um, uh, but they did it. It's not like, and it's not like we had some great reduction in knowledge. My guess is that in the worst case scenario, 90% of the knowledge that was supposed to be transmitted got transmitted, <laughs> even if it was unfamiliar. So that was possible. That was possible. There'll be two groups, but I have, I did online education started a, a, a year ago uh, because I wanted to have a class that was really, really large and we literally did not have lecture theaters in our building to handle a class that large. So I thought, well, I'll do it online. Um, and we'll, you know, that way I don't have to say to students, you know, stay out, you can't come in. And two things I learned from that. And uh, it'll be very interesting to see if my colleagues learned the same thing. First of all, students did a lot better in terms of assessment, learning, everything else than I'd ever achieved before when I was standing in, in a room. They learned a lot more. And part of the reason for that was it's very convenient when something is in a video for you to be able to pause, go back, review it later on. When you're in the lecture, you've got to be there right away doing it. You've got to be present that whole time. And then you've got five lectures in a row and stuff like that. It's just humanly difficult as opposed to being able to control things. The second thing I got was feedback. We prefer him in the room. <laughs> we don't like it. We don't like it. We don't like the uh, as much. Um, people, people enjoy, which is very nice for me. Very nice for me that people would pr rather have me in the room. That's, that's fine. Um, but that's what they said. So we've got this interesting and subsequent studies have confirmed that students don't like it, <laughs> but they do a lot better. Hmm. Ah, that's a, that's an issue for us, right? Uh, how do you as a, you know, future interim Dean, um, resolve that little trade off there? <laughs> where, where we want the students to both like it and learn, where there might be a trade-off. And so I think that's going to cause some interesting nuance here. I think actually the optimal model is to, is to have some sort of hybrid. Um, let me tell you, 
they can have 12 weeks of Joshua Gans. I think they'll probably enjoy four weeks of Joshua Gans in person <laughs> just as much. And we can shave off that not liking bit. And then they can learn as much from the other stuff. Um, so I think that's the kind of thing that we're going to see. Perfect. Well, uh, you really teed me up to conclude by saying we have enjoyed our one hour of Joshua Gans. Uh, but that's all the time we have today. Uh, I want to thank everyone in the audience for watching. Uh, and if one hour of Joshua Gans wasn't enough, um, there will be the, uh, the event um, online again when the uh, paperback edition of the book comes out, which you can currently um, register for. Uh, our next online event at Rotman Events will be the launch of the spring 2020 issue of Rotman Magazine. Uh, it will feature four Rotman School experts on the issue's theme of behavioral insights. That live stream will take place on May 26th at five o'clock, and you can register today on the Rotman Events website. Thank you, Joshua. Thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us today. Have a great evening. Thank you.